Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Cup Duet Reviews. My name is Jillian Robinson. I am the associate producer here at Cup of Hemlock Theatre, and today I am joined by the astonishing co-artistic producer, Ryan Barakovich. Ryan, how are you feeling today? I'm doing well. Getting over a bit of a cold, actually, so if I sound a little congested and occasionally cough, that is the culprit. But I'm happy to be here and talking about this piece. How are you doing today, Jill? I'm also doing well, and yes, on the other end of a cold, but feeling feeling healthy and kind of back to myself, which is nice as we're recording this in the January month, where it can be a tough one. So I'm excited to kind of get the creative juices flowing and unpacking today's piece, which get right to it. We are unpacking ARC's presentation of the Canadian premiere of Martyr by Marius von Mayenberg, translated by Maja Zad, directed by Rob Kempson. And it's happening here in Toronto at the Aki studio, Daniel Spectrum, from January 13th to January 29th. And yeah, so... Without further ado, let's, you know, do our little icebreaker. Ryan, what's in your cup? Yeah, I do have my cup of hemlock cup here, but it's just filled with water because I was, you know, we're filming this kind of late at night right after getting home from the performance. And I thought, oh, let's not go with anything overly caffeinated, but stay hydrated, folks. Yes, Uh, especially post-sickness. Stay hydrated. We love it. What's in your cup? I also have the cup cup with a little bit of my orange coral lipstick. On the drinking some Earl Grey tea. It's quite chilly out tonight, so I needed to warm up. So that's that's what I got. Got in my little trusty mug. So let's dive right in to this performance. Uh, Ryan, I'm gonna do my standard volley to you. Why don't can you open us up, open our viewers up to a synopsis of the piece that we saw today? So I guess we'll keep this non-spoilers before we get dig into more of the details later. But Martyr is a play that is, it, well, it's interesting because this being the Canadian premiere, I believe the original production is set in contemporary Germany. I think it premiered, I got some mixed answers in my Googling, but we're dealing with early to mid 2010s in Germany. But this production being very much set in this kind of here and now Canadian vaguely Canadian feel. I didn't make any specific allusions to a German setting, so that's interesting, and maybe there's something to unpack there. But it's set kind of today at some kind of private school, and our main character, his name is Benjamin Sinclair, Benny to his friends, is objecting to a lot of the things that go on in the school on religious grounds. And specifically, he the plot opens with his objection to co-ed swim class and he is very offended by his female classmates showing their flesh for lack of a better word in their swim classes and he's seems to have been taken on a very fundamentalist christianity streak that is disturbing his mother it's disturbing his teachers his classmates have varying opinions on it depending on where they stand in relation to him and it's all about the sort of fallout that comes from his adoption of this very radical Christianity and the way he imposes it upon everybody he meets and talks to. There's a lot more that happens. I, we can just say, still non-spoilery, that mm-hmm. he develops a special relationship with one of his classmates named George, who has you know vaguely defined disabilities. They talk about how one of his legs is shorter than the other, and at least the way he is performed in this particular production. He seems to have speech patterns that perhaps do imply some kind of neurocognitive disability, but that is never outwardly specified. And yeah, so he takes on this classmate of his as somewhat of a disciple in this interesting radical Christianity. One of his teachers, the biology teacher in particular, takes great umbrage with the way he is foisting his religious views upon everyone and wreaking havoc throughout the classroom and makes it her own personal crusade to resist him. His mother, who has recently gone through a divorce with his father, is at her wit's end and doesn't know what to do about it. A lot of, we could call it hijinks ensues, and it just Mm -hmm. gets more and more intense as the production goes on, culminating in a big ending that we will say after the spoiler shield goes up. Yeah, and I think this is a, can also be said before a spoiler shield, even the way that you, that was a lovely description, Ryan, the way that you mapped that out 
too, I noticed a lot of the terminology you were using kind of was overlapping religious vocabulary or, you know, bare bones of humanity and science versus art. And this is all apparent in in this piece that I recalled reading an article, how it's described as sort of the script being film-esque and in 27 short scenes. So just to kind of give our listeners, viewers, a scope into how the form of this piece sort of plays out, which is really neat in contrast or comparison to the themes, which I guess we can get into as we go down the line. But that that is the content in a nutshell. So I guess this is like a really good, I think, launch point to how this was carried out. Do you think, Ryan, I'll kind of let you be the judgment of this is kind of an early spoiler alert, but do you think I, we should just I pop would it say up? There? I don't necessarily want to be limited in what I feel like we can say about the acting, the production element. So why don't, before we go into the spoiler, why don't we just each say quickly our general thoughts about the piece? Yeah. Do we think people should go see it? And then we will put up. We usually decide some kind of interesting visual in advance, but we're going into this without having decided what should the spoiler shield be? Yes. Think about that while we each say our general appraisal. You want to go first? Sure. Yeah. I say, you know, along with every piece of theater, you all know me. Absolutely go see this piece because uh, how Ryan and I talk about it today can be similar to how you feel when you see it, can spark discussion or insight after you see it that maybe goes against what we say. And as always, there is so much amazing live theater happening in Toronto right now as we turn into 2023. So absolutely go see this piece. I was impacted and inspired as an actor as well as I was, I don't practice now, but I grew up Roman Catholic and up until university, I was in the Catholic school system. So there was a lot of thoughts and meditations, if you will, based on my connection that was with religion, the idea of puberty, the idea, I don't want to give away too many themes, but there is. There's a lot to absorb and observe. And so I would say absolutely get yourself out to the Aki Studio from now until January 29th so that you can have all of these fireworks going on in your brain. Brian, yeah, how about you? I will say this is a very interesting production. I'm still mulling over what I think about it. I definitely, Mm -hmm. the second the lights went down at the end, I was kind of like, that's it. That's what we're left with. And we will talk about the ending in particular. But I think this is a piece I'm going to be thinking about for a while. I'm, I'm on the fence about did I love it? Do I still need to think through a lot of these ideas? But I think good art does that. It leaves you in this state of yeah. tension after after you're released from it. I certainly do love things that I come out of just pumping my fist being like, yeah, that was so cool. That was really good. But I, there's also a place for pieces like this that do leave you scratching your head, contemplating what some of these connections are. And it's unfortunate that we do kind of have to get this review out in a timely manner so it can encourage people to go see yeah. it because I'd love to come back to this maybe a week or a month from now and be like, I figured it out. All of the thoughts make sense. I've been stewing on it for so long. But just in the immediate aftermath, I will say that this is surely a very fascinating piece. I think it speaks a lot to many of the differences between German dramaturgy and Canadian dramaturgy that often Mm -hmm. comes about when pieces like this, especially pieces from the Schaubrunna, which we've seen. I don't know if you saw the Tarragon productions of Enemy of the People, for example, that I think is an interesting example of this type of particular uber Brechtian, uber haha Germany type uh, yeah. of the theater trying to find its footing on Canadian stages. And there is a bit of a culture clash, which yeah. which may or may not serve the piece or spark different interesting ideas that I encourage everyone to go see it just so you can yeah. kind of sit with it the way I am. And mull over your thoughts and think about what it means to you, uh, how Mm -hmm. we connect with this piece, the many different themes, regardless of whether you're someone like yourself who grew up with, you know, some kind of Christianity or someone like myself who grew up with Judaism. And that does come Mm -hmm. up in this play as well. And or whether you were raised in a completely different faith or completely a religious, that's fine, too. I think you'll still find something to latch onto in this piece. Absolutely. And you mentioned Ryan too, and I totally stand by this as well as our company of ARC does just that with all of its pieces, like viewers, listeners, Ryan and I did a duet review on Gloria and that piece. Yeah. Like ARC really does stick to its mission of producing rigorous, bold, socially active pieces that leave its audience with questioning and yeah, questioning of self, questioning of form, questioning of emotional feedback. And so I agree with you, Ryan, like it, it's gonna, I picture myself a week from now being like, oh my gosh, that I didn't even think of that. And me still stewing over, uh, over martyr. 
So I guess this will be when our symbol shows up on the screen. What is it? it, A sign of the spoiler cross? What are we going with here? Do we need to decide? I think in real time, we'll leave it be this time, but there'll be something orange Mm, that'll show up. And orangey glad we put it up because now we are into the spoiler zone. Fair game from here on out. Of course, I let us in with a pun. Of course. Of course you did. Um, I wouldn't put it past you. (laughs) Great. So we are in it. So now let's go back to the, like I said, it was a launch pad. We've talked about how there are so many different themes of like religion and like science and art. And Ryan, you were chatting outside of this conversation too, but like, like how a lot of the themes in this play are kind of derivative of religion, which we'll get into in a second. But I guess let's start from like a production point of view through the acting and how like this piece was executed. And I think We can also talk about like the staging element of it too, but I guess let's talk about the acting first. Oh, it's a great place to start because the actors create the piece with their bodies and voices. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. So uh, before we kind of get into like individual cast shout outs, which I know we're both chomping at the bit to do, um, something that I thought was interesting about the acting of this piece is that it had, like, and this came down to everyone's performances it almost had this veneer of artifice over all of it. This feels like on one hand, it could be in a different production, a very realistic grounded piece mm-hmm. that is leans into the naturalism, but just based on the way all of the performers handled the text and handled other characters, there was a very much, I would that our director, Rob Kempson would proposed maybe early on the outset in the rehearsal process, like, we're going to approach this in a very mechanical way. And I don't mean that as like an insult that, oh, the acting was mechanical or wooden. I mean that it felt like a cohesive choice that the production was taking. And part of it, I think, maybe comes down to the translation itself. I know this is a, it's the Canadian premiere. It's certainly not the English language premiere of this piece. And I don't know if we're using the first English translation that is just being reused in this Canadian production, or if this was a new translation commission for this piece. Right. But the translation itself, I think, also was kind of leaning into this mechanical feel that a lot of the characters and their dialogues. Part of me, when I was like first encountering it and being a little jarred or perhaps even alienated or estranged in a Brechtian sense. The effect. <laughs> yeah. Yes. But part of me is like, oh, the speech patterns are interesting. The way the characters are talking, both in the actual words they're saying and the deliveries of the lines. And like, like for example, it's a silly one, but the character Lydia, her name was. The, yeah, Lydia Weber, played by Charlotte Dennis. Yeah, yeah, like she, from as early as I think it was the first scene or one of the first scenes, and when she is encountering Benjamin or Benny, she was like, "Oh, me and this boy Christian, we're going to get an ice cream." It's not like we're gonna go get ice cream or get some ice cream. Like it's, it was always, and this came up in multiple scenes. Like we're going to get an ice cream, and part of me yeah. is like, "Is this like a kind of?" robotronic way of like i am a teenager go to malt shop kind of thing or was it like part of me think is this just a very literal translation of whatever the german syntax would be and it hasn't necessarily been finessed into a more canadian vernacular i don't know i don't have the answer for you looks like you want to comment i just also again just maybe really needle nosing but like something it could also be this is just me like fishing for dramaturgy which also this is what i love about this piece too they're in a private school setting too right so and this we didn't mention this too but like the idea of the system like what types of systems kind of uh, This is a very broad way of saying it, but like Lydia, right, comes across as this character of doesn't really care, like laissez-faire, like rebellion, whatever. So in one way, in one vein, her vernacular is quite lax and um, yeah, like almost in your face a little bit. And then, but then you're right, the in ice cream, I almost, it's like, it's like, oh, because she too is in this packaged private school system. And I think what's interesting about that and is now that I'm saying it out loud is our headmaster. So Willie Belford played by Ryan Allen. He is definitely, again, what Ryan touched on, the mechanical-esque way. To me, his character was the most caricature-ist on stage. And he was like the person who is has all the power being the headmaster, 
but his cadences even did sound like packaged more in this like this is my script of how I say things because I am I'm putting on this face of being stuck under this roof of like private school. These are the rules. This is how we play by. Yeah. So it's subtle. Like it's so subtle. And I think at the end of the day, like religion is the pulse of this piece, but it's little things like this that now I'm saying it out loud of you can't forget that this is all happening under the roof of a private school. At like yeah. a secular private school specifically, mm-hmm. which is why religion becomes such a disruptive force in it. I think, especially like in the types of communities we grew up in, there seems to be this conflation of private school and Catholic school. And this, that yeah. is a long history of why that is baked into the Canadian charter and why that like that probably doesn't have equivalence in Germany specifically. But the idea of this being, yes, even if religion is this foreign invader into this space, at least it's radical religion, like the kind mm-hmm. that Benny is introducing into it, it is still very much this disciplinary environment with its trying to be liberal and very kind of politically correct in a lot of ways, you know, with the co-ed swimming and, you know, treating the, you know, the way that the principal treats the students, et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of the day, it's still, yes, we are confined in this disciplinary institution. And yeah, like Ryan Allen's performance as his headmaster is very interesting that you felt very artificial in a good way that like, yeah. you, you use the word caricature. I think that's very good. But you almost felt like a parody of a mindless administrator who's just spinning everything that comes to him in the way that'll become the path of least resistance. So to avoid any possible lawsuit, so that seemed like yeah. his super objective in every scene he was in. Yeah, I kind of love that. He had funny mannerisms. He was like super misogynistic, especially towards uh, the biology teacher, Erica yeah. White, the character's name was, <laughs> that he, you know, had the most confrontation with as she's tr- constantly trying to levy complaints against the way that Benny's behaving in class. And he's like, I will take the male student's side over yeah. the actual teacher who's supposed to be the authority figure here. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, it was very well done in a way. So to, yeah, to just kind of, put a cap on this idea of the mechanical performances in both the language and the delivery. I think it was a choice. Like I anticipate, I, I could be very wrong. I look forward to reading other critics reviews. We came on a press night, so obviously nobody else's review is out yet, but yeah. I anticipate some critics will probably see this and be like, the acting felt wooden. The acting felt like, what you know, not real or hard to connect with. And I think in the spirit of a very Brechtian German type of production, I think they're trying to translate that type of essence into the overarching way of it. I think it also allowed, because as we're talking this out too, every character had a very distinct way of talking and how they use their phrases and when and why they use their phrases. And I think something like the mechanical... I'm just going to cut right to it. Like our protagonist, Benny and Erica, the biology teacher is both of them are kind of like our protagonist slash antagonist. I would maybe argue. Yeah. And both of them talk in phrases that work for them. And it's heavy handed, lots of terminology text. So for instance, Benny is speaking biblical verses. Literally 85% of the character's language is are these heavy handed biblical passages that even like I said, I study parable parables all throughout grade school, and high school myself, you know, church hymns, etc, etc. A lot of these passages, I don't recall seeing or they weren't included in my syllabus because they are the sort of heavy passages. But then on the flip side, and comparatively, Erica White, being our biology teacher, her her vocabulary rather is very scientific and terms that she uses that like it's this scale of like the Bible and a biology textbook. Both of these characters could have been walking on the stage reading directly from these texts. Right. So like it almost it's interesting because, again, like now we're talking this out, too. It's like the other mechanical way of acting. Yes, Ryan, I think literally it's them grappling with maybe the translation of the text and how to place it on a Canadian stage, too. But I think it really allows for these other two characters whose language is quite right in their eyes and fluid to really stand out. 
in a way. Yeah. But that's and just I how think, I feel. And you and others might feel something totally different. I think that's the magic of this piece. And I think Erica, like you mentioned, like, oh, she's... I, I, like, please correct me if I'm mis- misrepresenting the ideas you're putting out here, but like she she treats her scientific jargon similar to how Benny treats his religious jargon. And I think that's true to a point, but then about halfway through the piece, she pivots into, you know, the religious junkie as her partner in the play. Let's say I forget his character name. Dixon, Marcus Dixon. Yeah, Marcus Mm -hmm. Dixon. He's her romantic partner, another teacher at the school. And when she decides that she's going to beat Benny at his own game and read the Bible vigorously so she can prove that everything he's saying is a misinterpretation and Jesus is gay, actually. And, you know, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. He describes her as this becoming a religious junkie, which is almost just as bad as the devout religious person who gets swept up because they believe in it. Somebody who gets swept up out of spite more than anything could be right. just as harmful. And we are past the spoiler part here, so we don't need to unpack the ending just yet, but I would argue that you... I think you put it very well that they're both sort of both protagonists and antagonists, Benny and Erica. And the title Martyr, we believe that it's referring to Benny the whole time. He's the one who has this delusion of grandeur, sees himself as somebody who's going to die for his beliefs, whatever that means. And we're watching this piece waiting to see how that's going to culminate. But the martyrdom that comes at the end is Erica. She's the one who nails herself to the cross in a very literal and metaphorical way. Yeah. Nails her shoe to the headmaster's office and declares, paraphrase, like, I'm not leaving because the new batch of students is coming in next year and I'm not leaving because I'm right. Yeah. Sacrificing herself for the sins of the school, essentially. We can unpack the ending more in detail at the end. But I do think it's interesting the way that these we've gotten a bit off base from the acting itself. So we'll come back to that now. But it's interesting the way language of religion and science and you know, the scientific mind in defense of science turns to religion and, you know, is the one who embraces the big religious imagery at the end more so than the other character who we might have thought was more destined for it. Yeah, I think this is a wonderful pivot to let's can we just go right to the religious themes sure, and good. how look because we're kind of already we're dancing around it. But again, like you had said, Ryan, in a pre-chat to this recording of like there's the themes of like sexuality and like prejudice, fundamentalism, radical, like all of these things are derivative of religion and present on the stage. And let's just, let's talk about it. I guess like it opened to me, it opens one of the eye opening things me leaving was yeah, religion, you know, whether you are atheist or, you know, a born again Christian or whatever faith or you know, was raised a certain way and your beliefs have changed. The history of humanity stems a lot from religion because that's kind of one of the main facets of history that we have immortalized in texts. I'm kind of rambling all around here, but let's just talk about it. (laughs) Yeah, like, so it's interesting, the thing that you alluded to that I mentioned to you just while we were on our way back here to record this, Mm-hmm. After seeing the show, like when we were talking, okay, what are some of the themes we might want to talk about? And I said, well, every single theme I can think of is just religion plus blank. Religion yeah. plus sexuality is a theme. Religion plus pr- prejudice is a theme, et cetera, et cetera. You go through the whole list. And I don't know, part of, I guess, maybe why, if I'm trying to unpack my mixed feelings about this piece, is that I think it's saying or at least trying to say something very prescient right now about fundamentalism and radicalism something that is clearly still a very big problem in society like if we're looking even just at this you know private school setting and what happens when one student becomes radicalized and radicalized can be either religion in the very literal case of this play or a different religion or alt-right tendencies that may or may not be related to religion at all you name it I was pretty convinced that this play was going to end with Benny shooting up the school or enacting Mm. some kind of violence, because that's, I think, how we're primed to engage with this type of radicalism. Somebody has a fundamental belief that they will not pivot on. They feel like they are persecuted by their peers and teachers and authority figures because they don't have, you know, because they're the only one who's correct and everyone else is wrong and violence will ensue. That is the logical endpoint of 
any kind of fundamentalist belief, or at least one that's marginalized in this way. And, but at the same time, like, I, and I think that, that is a great, like, interesting theme that is still clearly for how many school shootings, you know, are happening very unfortunately too frequently and tragic and all the thoughts and prayers hey religious imagery doesn't make it go away reforming gun laws does you know for the most part but it's so while i do think that theme is very yes we should be having conversations about this demonstrating on stage and there's other plays that do justice to this theme in interesting ways the grounding in religion for me and specifically this is Christian religious fundamentalism, which I understand is a big problem in many parts of the world today. And, you know, we look at things like the recent Supreme Court ruling on Roe v. Wade being, you know, mobilized by certainly the political right, but a lot of religious views are what's fueling not just the justices who make the ruling, but the public that they believe they're supporting. And I don't want to diminish any of that, but part of me feels that if this play was written in, I believe, 2012, when I read that, I thought, yeah, that checks out because to me, the version of religious fundamentalism and the kinds of arguments that the play presents both for and against it, this feels like something that was very popular on YouTube 10 years ago, like as in the atheists debunking religion, like the entire, like most of Erica's dialogue felt like that. Like, I get it. There's this catharsis to it and maybe people who spent less time on YouTube during that particular period in history than maybe I did and others did. Like this, maybe they're being introduced to these ideas for the first time, or they're someone who like, I respect religion, but I haven't read the Bible thoroughly enough to, you know, be able to debunk these claims or say these things like, this feels like a play for them or a play that is very much part of that discourse 10 years ago, but feels like for its Canadian premiere now, I'm like, I feel like we've had these conversations a while ago. And I don't really know, is the point that these are still evergreen conversations that we haven't quite moved as far away from as we'd hope, but it, it feels very like, like, I, I know 2012 was already, you know, the beginning of Obama's second term, but it feels very like Bush era religious debate, the kind mm -hmm. of thing that was like, uh, you know, creationism as the this existential threat to human epistemology. Like, I... <laughs> and mm. when you, I see a character like Benny, who's just spewing hatred, the most vile stuff, I'm like, do we even need to debunk this? Is this not so ball-facedly wrong, even if mm. you do believe in the higher power that he's supposedly getting this from? Like, there's a reason why most people don't quote the particular Bible passages that he was putting forward, the ones that are always all about all of the, you know, the violence, the misogyny, sexual violence, et cetera, et cetera. Using the Bible as a sword was something that came up a lot here. I mean, most people, even religious people, are smart enough to cherry pick the nice parts about love thy neighbor and turn the other cheek. Because, mm -hmm. it, you know, and it's very easy to say, like, you know, as Erica does, that the Bible's so inconsistent. You can find all kinds of stuff. And yeah, because the Bible wasn't one book. It is a mm -hmm. whole bunch of different books that eventually got canonized into one book. And the only reason why we actually can carry it around as one book is a lot to do with the technology of the printing press, which is a whole separate thing. But of course, it's polyvocal. It has, it's written by a, a whole hundreds of different authors with different perspectives. You can, it's very hard to use the Old Testament to back up anything that you say in the New Testament and vice versa. Mm -hmm. It's a mess, I guess, is the thesis <laughs> of what I'm saying here. The Bible's a mess. I'm not telling anyone not to believe in what it says, but it's just, yeah, it's not, there's a, uh, I forget his name, Timothy Beale, I think it was, wrote this book called The Rise and Fall of the Bible. And he was a religious scholar and he is personally like Christian and believes in the Bible himself. But he said that it's wrong to think of the Bible as this magic eight ball that you flip it open and you'll find the answers of how to good, live a good life, yeah. how to go about it. Like it's it just, if you think about the history of how this artifact came to us, it fundamentally is not that. Right. It doesn't mean there's no value in it, but you need to think about it more historically if you want to get value out of it. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm rambling about religion. It's okay. <laughs> I do want to go back to you. Yeah, I think it's valid what you're bringing up of, you know, I always say this with media that I came into contact with in like 2010 to 2015. I personally 
see a lot of media very outdated from that time frame in particular nowadays. So like, I totally hear what you're saying. But the one thing that's interesting, it, it, this being the Canadian premiere, I get what you're saying about do we need to, I, we've been talking about it this way, we, but as liberal artists like you and I are, Ryan, and you, especially coming from like a scholarly background, I think it, at, you have every right to say that and be having been talked about it. But I would argue that audiences that were in there with us tonight maybe haven't been. And I think what's really neat about this piece and the way that it was presented to us, it exposed these extreme situations. So for instance, like religion and sexuality, quite literally the characters of Benny and George have a scene where they are only in their knickers and are laying down and they share a kiss. So not all like it's like exposing quite literally in the flesh, you know, you were pumped with this religion via Benny literally quoting the Bible. And then you see these two young pubescent boys naked sharing a kiss or again, the monologue moments of Benny kind of choosing to kind of spew religion as one of his oral presentations instead of talking about the Industrial Revolution or having those moments of lecturing about his views at George, not necessarily even to George. Again, we're infused, injected with all this religious jargon, but then again, the conversation that he has with Erica of like, this battle between the science and religion. So it's interesting. I feel like all of these themes of like sexuality of like, again, the battle between science and religion in the family space, right? The scenes with him and his mother, it's like how are what we could maybe deem everyday scenarios or ways of life milestone moments how are they inspired or impacted by religion? And it's this piece doesn't let us see anything that we see on stage without religion being like another castmate. So that I feel, again, this is me, possibly maybe this is me just trying to make sense of why this piece, why now? I think it's a very interesting, it's an exposure of maybe the theme, the way we've been talking about religion. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you know, you know what? Sorry, I, I like everything you're saying, and I, I will kind of see the ground that yes, the way I think about this and my kind of own personal trajectory with religion, with agnosticism, with thinking through these mm -hmm. ideas, maybe isn't common to everyone's experience, and a lot of people might be encountering these ideas in this critical framework for the first time. But granted, I, I will give that. But just, I guess, a funny thought that I just had in response to what you're saying now, and it might be because this is sort of on my mind lately, because. I feel like this play actually is the anti-Tartuffe, which is <laughs> interesting. Sorry, sorry. This might feel like a non sequitur a bit, but you talked the way you just spoke about religion, got my brain on this track here. Is It's on my mind because, you know, I just taught it in the class that I TA for and Theodore Arendale at University of Toronto Mississauga campus just did a production of Tartuffe mm -hmm. and I saw that. But while teaching Tartuffe, in the 21st century, in the post-truth era, we, you know, we do have conversations in the classroom about how, yeah, this, who are the Tartuffes today? Who are the ones who hide behind things like religion or, you know, sanctity, whatever you want to call it, whether it's religion specifically, to push forward their agenda, even if they don't believe it or are just using it as a smokescreen. And I mm -hmm. think why I call this play the anti-Tartuffe is that Tartuffe, works they're both the character in the play because it's you know orgon runs is a religious man who runs his household in a religious manner and if he meets the most religious person in the world by e. tartuffe he's going to welcome him with open arms and say this is the best person i've ever seen and the fact that tartuffe himself is a charlatan and he's just using that to gain good graces so he can accumulate capital and blackmail material that's you know that's the big irony of the play. But this play is interesting because it's not set in a religious environment. Religion is this foreign invader, as I've already described it. And it's not that Benny doesn't believe the religion. He does believe it. And that's the problem. That's the part that disrupts the house. And it is this interesting engagement of the secular people, Erica first and foremost, but everyone who comes in contact with it needing to engage not with the falsehood of this religion but the sincerity of it and how in our secular space that sincerity 
you know, fundamental kind of over the top, dangerous fundamentalism of religion is this threat that needs to be grappled with. And I think that there actually maybe is a sly commentary in there, not that this this comparison is engendered anywhere specifically in the text, but, it, you know, I think of the Schaubrunner as this company that takes old texts, mostly Ibsen, and says, okay, how do we create the radical effect of seeing these plays in late 19th century Norway? You know, for example, one of their most famous productions, Nora, as they called it, was there a production of a doll's house where it's not enough of a shock to just have her slam the door and leave her husband because the divorce rate's so high now. This isn't shocking. So she needs to shoot her husband. That, you know, it's not saying that this is something that women should do. Shoot all your husbands if they're being bad people. But it's just saying that, you know, we want to give the audience the shock that the original ending had. We need to adjust for inflation. So I think maybe we could view this piece as a Tartuffe for today's audience. That's not about, okay, let's identify who the Tartuffes are today, but what does religion mean in a society that has moved past it? And what does the presentation of devoutness do to these spaces? Is it necessarily like entrenched in a religious environment? What's something that is neat is we know that Benny's mom, Ingrid, Ingrid Sinclair, is a single parent working night shifts. She wears scrubs, so probably a nurse somewhere in the healthcare system. But a single parent who is still putting her child in a privatized school, which that is not cheap, that is very expensive. And frustrated by the extreme ways in which he's tapping into religion, but not shocked by it, and also is open to hearing the vicar's advice, is open to having a child maybe be kind of interested in it, even though she says, like, you know, can I just have a normal pubescent teenager who collects football stickers and wha- wanks off every once in a while. Great line. Like the fact that she still is open to, there is an a religious, some shape or form upbringing or exposure to Benny, right? Like I doubt he was just like, huh, ding, ding, ding. I'm going to go consult the Bible for fun. And I, if there wasn't those scenes of Ingrid kind of, being open to the fact of these things, then I would maybe say, yeah, maybe he just wanted to take up biblical studies. So it's just interesting, like, this is again getting into, like, Benny's before play upbringing. But I don't know. I guess this is kind of coming out as, like, a rambly response. But I'm rambling, like, please respond in kind. I think we also, in the same vein, should talk about the lack of tangible physical father figure that is in Benny's life. So, you know, right off the cuff, we get intel that the Ingrid's husband has left and was a terrible person towards her. And you're basically given a pamphlet of like, so Benny has daddy issues and that's going to set you up for his, you know, in eternal trust to the almighty god father like god as father not marlon brando but also he uses the word father a lot in place of god or in and around god and it, there actually is a kind of spoon-fed scene where he's using i'm going to see my father and his mother ingrid being like oh what he came in contact with you like, well don't do that he's a terrible person thinking that he's literally talking very on the nose scene in my yeah. opinion bit much for me yeah 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 but again that by no fault of the actors in the production like that's literally yeah part of the text yeah i personally feel like we should get back to the actors because we started talking about broad strokes in the acting and then that spun us onto themes but who are your shout outs who did you like i have to instantly go erica white played by evie viva armor astroff i have our pamphlet here and my notes written in orange but uh, yeah so aviva's performance of erica it has to get my shout out i honestly think it because i relate a lot to her, which is i guess it's a selfish way of choosing her as my shout out i just think she was very much the realist version of how the audience might be feeling i guess is how i'll say that because i don't want to speak for everyone else but just a scientific bare bones these are the facts character who does show like 
interest in others. But then, you know, as the play in carries on, you she kind of does get sucked into yeah sucked into to Benny's games as she kind of mentions it and then that kind of spins her on the head but I just think she like you mentioned Ryan I think she is the martyr at the end and yeah I just thought her performance was always very genuine and real and from the hip and yeah she had to deal with all of the misogyny she had to deal with being the only woman in the room a lot of the times. And even the woman that she could relate to was Ingrid, who they never were on the same page because they were always thinking so-and-so was the problem for why Benny was the way that he was. And I just think she, yeah, she got a lot thrown on her, a lot of weight to carry. And I think Aviva's performance was phenomenal. Like, yeah. Yeah, How about you? Yeah, she was definitely a big standout for me. And I think this comes back to what I was saying earlier about the mechanical acting. Is while I think she still played into that because I do think that was an overarching directing note, I would imagine, for the entire piece. She, she I think, did display what I would call the most naturalistic acting. And perhaps that is a deliberate rupture in the overall mechanical veneer of the main ensemble, specifically because she is, I think, like you said, intended as an audience POV. She's mm-hmm. the one who is most, like a lot of people are contrary to Benny's religious views, but she's the one who really get, gets invested in, okay, what are the what are the practical steps we can do to not just say you're wrong or wish you would change, but show you that you're wrong and convince you to change. And I think we are invited to, you know, treat her as this co-protagonist, protagonist, antagonist type figure, however we want to see it, that mm-hmm. represents our frustration in a way that like Ingrid is also I think that type of character but she's not the one coming with the solutions she's just yeah. oh my son what can I do what's wrong with him I just wish he was on drugs because that would at least be simple this is very much yeah what we're given with Erica and specifically Aviva's performance is that, yeah I am Hercule Poirot or I am Miss Marple or Sherlock Holmes I am the detective i.e. <laughs> the person who the audience is following along as they find clues, unpack the case in this yeah. way, to which I think is neat. And I think, yeah, she was a real standout. Another s- shout out that I would give, because I thought he was just phenomenal, the actor who played George, and his name was, I have it in the program here, Adriano Reyes. I yes. hope I'm pronouncing that right. Yes, he, every time he was on stage, was just magic. He had a lot of like heavy lifting to do in this performance because, as I mentioned earlier, he is, the character is disabled, both physically and possibly uh, mentally. And while well, that's never explicitly stated the latter, I think that did permeate throughout the performance. And in a way, I thought that made his, his engagement with the mechanical acting feel at once the quintessence of it that he had just through the way that he saw the world and related to the other characters specifically Benny most of all was very much yeah it's he had this I guess slightly robotic feels like the wrong word but this kind of like very tightly wound way of going about it you want to jump in there i just think it's a direct reflection of the character like always wanting to tie onto structure and stick to the status quo and do what is seen as the norm because he's compensating for him being an outsider and he's very well aware that he's an outsider so i just you bring it up and i do want to piggyback and think it's so lovely that the way yeah adriano uses the text in george's voice to to do just that. Like, I think most of the chuckles that happened were some of the just completely naive and like unknowingly witty responses that came out of George. And it's simply because he's just following what he thinks he should be following and who he talks to and how he talks to them. Yeah. Which is a great like use of the mechanicalness and infusing it into the character as opposed to placing it placing the character in it. Uh, this is something I knew we wanted to talk about, so we might as well bring it up here. Mm-hmm. Is that a lot of the mechanical nature of this acting, I think, deprived the piece of what we might call empathy. And if we're thinking in Brechtian terms, that makes sense because, you know, Brecht didn't believe that actors should empathize with their characters or should, like, connect with them in that way that, you know, as part of the alienation estrangement effect, you do put yourself at this critical distance so you don't get attached if you're crying you're not thinking was a big way that he put it Mm -hmm. and 
I think it is true that so many of the characters are lacking empathy, even, you know, you know Deb playing the mother character, Ingrid, here is she's, we can understand, like, yeah, she's frustrated at her child, and, you know, she does care for him, but we don't see this maternal connection. Yep. Again, you know, being a single mother, raising a teenager who gives you nothing but grief, I get it. I get why she is not there, but George is the character who brought the empathy. In my opinion, he's the only character who brought the empathy, and that's why he's just this little mm-hmm. ball of sunshine throughout the entire piece. And I think he didn't know it. I think that's the wonderful yeah. thing, too, right? Is he's just because I think you're right, too. And this is going back to if I was writing an essay, I'd be like the way in which each character's voice is different in literally the way the actors carry out the speech patterns or the sentences differs astronomically between each person, I think falls right into what you're saying, too, Ryan, of like, how can you have empathy or sympathy when you aren't willing to talk on the same level or at the same level as everyone else or talk, be open to the way that someone's views are being orated or, you know, and you even see that in the reflection, taking it even further in the reflection of some of the scenes. As I mentioned earlier, it's their filmic-esque scenes, and there's 27 of them, and quite literally, and we'll get into this, what I'm about to say, we'll get into the staging a little bit too, but it was done almost as each scene was kind of like a scene study on a bare bone stage, and then the actors kind of do a breath and they segue instantly into the next scene. And so there's almost no empathetic or space for empathetic resolve in any of these scenes, quite literally, because the form doesn't leave room to do that. You're snapped out and you're brought back in. And then the I'm just thinking too a scene where with we mentioned this before too, like Dixon and Erica are teachers at Benny's school, but they're also partners and like life partners, love lovers per se. And instead of, you know, Dixon's very frustrated when Erica gets wrapped up in like being wrapped up in the Bible and like, you know, being so one nosed, I'm gonna beat him at his own game. I'm gonna come at him with these uh, scriptures, whatever. He's like, come to eat dinner. This is frustrating that you're doing this. This is frustrating. you. He's not, neither one of them are unpacking each other's why or how. And quite literally, the next scene of the two of them is him with his bags already packed and a toothbrush in hand and her being like, wait, 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 what? what? Where is it? So there's no genuine communication happening between any of these characters except George's side of communication with the characters he's in scenes with, I guess. Yeah. And, I, and I'm glad you bring up like Dixon and Erica's relationship is so interesting because I feel like when we first meet Dixon, we expect him to be this kind of like you know, moral center heart of the story, another character who brings the empathy and he gets, you know, legitimately frustrated when his romantic partner falls down this obsession rabbit hole with a student and, you know, it's, Mm -hmm. but yeah, you're absolutely right that we don't get to see like this, you know, genuine loving relationship. There is this big miscommunication distance between them to the point that, yeah, we even see this, these scenes of their relationship rupturing. And then the next time we see them on stage together in the final scene, he instantly like he's a turncoat he when Mm -hmm. when benny tries to frame erica for sexual misconduct as his way of breaking her Mm -hmm. yeah dixon instantly like doesn't say like okay hold on let's think about this for a moment he's like this makes so much sense why you're so like obsessed and physically moves himself to the side of the stage of the characters that are already against erica too so yeah Yeah. that's it, it, he feels like it's interesting, like Richard's performance of Dixon, like brought this out so well, because he, he's a bit of a false flag character who we're expecting to like, and then just doesn't give us what we need, just like mm-hmm. he's not giving Erica what she needs in this relationship, and vice versa. I'm not saying, yep. you know, he's in the wrong and she's done nothing wrong, but there's fault in both sides of this, you know, not very healthy relationship, and it's probably better that it ends. As and it again, he, like Erica, her first instinct, as, so both Erica and Dixon being teachers of Benny, I realize I'm saying Erica, but it's Miss White and Mr. Dixon, it's Mark. Marcus, but what have you, but Erica, you know, once Benny sort of, it's very obvious that he is literally his vocabulary is the Bible as a teacher, they both come at this student very differently. And so Erica, I would argue she does, she has the sort of matriarchal 
initial response of like, okay, there's clearly something off with him. I'm going to try to get to the core, to the center of this student to figure out why he is extremely thinking and acting the way he is. Whereas almost instantly Dixon is like, "Eh, he's just a student. We're older than him. We're more experienced. He's just speaking off his mouth. If he he goes off and doesn't do the uh, industrial revolution properly, I just fail him and it's fine. I'm not going to spend waste mental energy thinking about this student. I just... He's not going to do well in school and he'll have to repeat this year. It's fine. Yeah. So like his em- yeah. empathy meter doesn't even start to tick with yeah. Benny. And it's interesting. This is, we're bringing this up. You know, we've kept talk. we keep talking about how each character speaks a different way. Each character has their own beliefs and is hard sticking to that note. Every character is in their own swimming lane. Mm, like They're that. in their own lane. This is how the piece opens is... It's this, like Ryan has said it before, you know, Benny is refusing to partake in swimming classes or because they're co-ed, because, you know, he mentioned some things like, you know, it's disturbing seeing women's classmates flush, et cetera, et cetera. So it's opening. He's, his mom is asking all these questions. Why just go to swim practice, go to swim. And it's just, I just have this thing of everyone is in their own swim lane and the reason why it also corresponds to no one's listening no one's hearing is because when you're in underwater you can't hear anything Uh you just have the one goal in mind and you're staying in between these structured lanes to get to the end and your objective is to win the race that's what your main objective is so it's all of these people and i guess i would argue now me being like oh maybe the pool is religion Everyone is swimming in the same pool or in the same structure. I guess I'll just like, you know, we could also say the pool is this school setting or the pool is this town or whatever, but everyone has their own lane. Anyways, I don't know. That was just a little thing. I I, I think we're unpacking the themes. Every topic kind of brings us back to the themes. And I think this thematically rich piece does that. I know there's other production elements we wanted to make sure we touched on. Yes, so that's, and like that's... We, but before we also do that, mm-hmm. uh, acting wise, I, I don't think we've shouted out in the bill enough. Yeah, the, yes. the lead just so, because he carries this piece on his back yeah. a lot. Do you want to comment more on him? Yes. So absolutely, I was gonna say that Ryan, like before we kind of pivoted to themes and empathy, I was like, wait, we need to talk about. It. We saw in a bill in Gloria, fascinating, fascinating work, like. I, watching what he did, me being an actor, watching him tonight, I was inspired and impacted from just a practical point of view to start because it is very hard playing a character like that. And also this character is interesting because he's always, Benny's always a, thinks that he's the most high status and does not waver one bit, but never is he in the scene, the character with high status, in my opinion. Like it was this very weird subversive way of status Mm -hmm. that I think he, Nabil, like actor, executed that brilliantly. Yeah, I can tell you exactly like what he did. He's a shitty teenager, is for lack of a better word. Like he he thinks I'm the smartest person in the room and with this religious backing, he's like, and I have the moral justification that not only am I smarter than everyone else around me, but I am the only one who's righteous. And yeah. yeah, but in every scene he's in, he is, you know, maybe aside from the scenes that are just him and George, but he is the lower status character in every scene. Yeah, mm-hmm. he thinks he's the highest status. And yeah, you're exactly right to kind of pinpoint that and, you know, it's funny how we're kind of, like, coming to him now. He, you know, as the, the lead character, he's in the most scenes. He has the most complex dialogue. A lot of it is just Bible quotes. And he's, I think, a deplorable person, as I feel like most of us would agree. But, yeah, like, the performance is masterful here, the way that he does yeah. get into this mindset of a self-righteous teenager, even without all of putting all that religious baggage on top of it and how that leads into radicalism and anti-Semitism and violence, mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it wasn't until halfway through the piece that I watching, because again, I think it was like you, Ryan, I was waiting for there to be a twist. I was waiting for there to be some sort of nuance in Benny that is, you know, we got a scope into maybe, oh, this is exactly why he's the way he is. Was he 
you know, we have a little intel of like his father, but we don't know much more than that. We have a like, he doesn't, the idea of talking about sexuality or genitalia doesn't, you know, kind of, he gets his back up about that, but that's as much as we kind of get. And it wasn't until halfway through the piece that I was like, oh my goodness, I don't think this character will waver or back down. And the only moments we kind of maybe see that is when he's in dialogue or monologue with himself rather, but it's not really wavering. It's kind of almost him needing to recharge his battery of why he's doing it. He's not doubting why he's following the extremist path that he wants to, but he's needing to sit with his thoughts and sit with God to almost like recharge his battery, if you will. It's never like, maybe this isn't the answer. Maybe I'm all wrong. Like, so halfway through the piece, I get that, okay, this character doesn't wave. And then when he goes even farther and harder with the like anti-Semitism and, you know, just, yeah. And he starts very much almost acting as a cult leader to George. It's like, whoa, not only is this person not wavering, but now they're getting like very intense and larger concepts than just a teenager read a couple passages in the Bible and wants to implement in everyday life. Like now we're tackling large isms with this person. And I just, yeah, I thought it was, it was so fascinating. And it's something because it's such an extreme way, it's not one note at all because there is still this lovely, awkward, timid, teenagery, prepubescent, pubescent boyishness that Nabil infuses. So the physicality of the character is low status or timid. And that's how he's compensating for the oral and mental high status. So it's almost like, it's like the classic thing of when you're given a character, right? It's like, you have to find the opposites and play the opposites, right? And like show that in both action and in text. But I feel like what we saw was very, like the text, the spoken text was very high status, yet the physicality was very low status and pacing the stage and doing like little mannerisms. And I just thought, Seeing those contrasts in one character by one actor was just brilliant. Orange. The, the color of orange. So we walk into the space and there's orange chairs. Like, so first of all, this space is alley. It's alleyway staging. So there is a subtly raised rectangular platform and there's orange chairs that line the shorter ends of the rectangle and then the audiences line the longer ends. And as we're walking into the theater, we notice there is an orange motorcycle helmet. There's a basket of orange carrots. So I'm like, okie dokie, orange is already a theme or a motif in this piece. And it doesn't stop there because every other prop, like the toothbrush I mentioned that Dixon has, is orange. Every character has an orange accent or a piece of costume up until like the headmaster's socks are orange. Lydia's laces on her school shoes are orange. The cardigan that Ingrid wears throughout the piece is orange. So a lot of orange. uniforms especially. Like uh, the, yes. the ties are, have the orange stripes. Like it's you know, it's yeah. very interesting how much orange there is, mm -hmm. and it draws your attention to the places where there is not orange. So to the point where I just took a little trip down Google dramaturgy lane of like the color of orange, and so many things were brought to my attention, and I'm just gonna sort of orange vomit them out to you, Ryan, and our listeners. Orange can leave be a color it said that be a color that leaves you with very ambiguous feelings because orange can resemble like a if it's a sunshiny sort of like a sunny d-esque orange you're kind of thinking warm fuzzy summer maybe relaxing vibes or vibrant excited vibes or if it's more of a rustic orange like a pine pineapple a pumpkin <laughs> your pineapples are orange that's a problem like a pumpkin or autumn leaves that's that can make you feel a different opposite way to how summer makes you feel, right? You're feeling maybe more stoic and deeper. So anyways, also orange can represent or be a symbol of simplicity, of letting go of materialism. Orange can symbolize a quest for knowledge, can symbolize fertility. Orange is a very 
not a very apparent and used color motif in Christianity, at least specifically speaking Roman Catholicism, but in Eastern religions, absolutely it is in Buddhism and Hinduism. So yeah, so there's a lot to unpack about orangeness. And I think the one that resonated with me coming through all of that is this orange being because it's so open to interpretation of what that color evokes. It's a feeling of ambiguousness, which I think adds just like another texture to our sort of needing to step back and marinate on the piece vibes. Uh, you, you go yeah. ahead. And, yeah, yeah. Like I did not do the same Google search deep dive that you did. I heard you kind of coming to your discoveries as you did it. But to me, it's interesting because, yeah, I, I agree that orange isn't a color that we associate with Christianity or Christian themes. And I think if I had to venture a guess at what orange represents, it is the, I would say it's the secular. It is the, you know, it's part of the school uniforms. And I think we've kind of determined this is a mostly a religious school, even if there is a vicar on hand for some religious studies education. But yeah, this is a secular space. The orange is everywhere. The, the carrots, I feel like, is this prominent image of we're going to learn sex education, put a condom on this carrot. Like, it, it is, you know, it's representing the flesh, the body, the it's not the spiritual, the soul. And what I think is very interesting is we have, when we first meet Benny, he's wearing his school uniform, including the orange striped tie. But then in a very early scene, when we see the bill pour water on his head, kind of reminiscent of the ice bucket challenge, what it's supposed to represent yeah. him jumping into the pool with his clothes on, and then he gets changed we, he never puts the tie back on after the orange tie, that mm -hmm. he's still in his school uniform, but without the symbol of orange conformity that links him. So part of me, and I think the vicar character, who whose costume has maybe slight accents of warm colors, but not orange specifically, or I was struggling to mm -hmm. find a piece mm -hmm. of orange garment on him, so... Christianity, as represented by these characters, is the absence of orange, and then mm -hmm. George loses a lot of his clothing as he becomes more and more indoctrinated by Benny's preaching. He, you know, he no longer has his orange tie and all that stuff. So I do see this diminishment of orange as this visual signifier that a character is moving farther and farther away from some kind of secularism that is preached by the environment. Do you want to chime in on that? Or I have more thoughts. Well, I was just going to say when these characters shed their orangeness, let's say it is more apparent that the color that they are donning is blue. So George's underwear is blue. He's wearing blue briefs. Benny puts on like a blue card, like a navy blue cardigan at one point. The vicar's like undershirt is blue. And this is, again, maybe I'm fishing for the dramaturgical. Colors. <laughs> but if we think of a flame... The most intense part of that flame is blue. The most extreme, the most extreme hot element of the element of fire is blue. The core of a flame is blue. And obviously fire is a common theme in religion. Because I guess, and this is me still gathering my thoughts, but like I noticed the orange so much so, but I also noticed because I was very aware of the orange that when the orange was shed, my brain instantly was like, what is the color that's in place of it? And it was blue. And I'm still trying to figure out yeah. Yeah, like, why I mean, blue and maybe there's something like, to that, like the intensity. Like I, I love what you've done, like trying to research what does orange mean, what are associations and symbolism. But like part of my feeling about it is that like, I think, the orange exists to just draw your attention to this and kind of prompt questioning like we're yeah. doing right now. I don't think there are necessarily concrete answers, and but it's an invitation to, to think through. But the, I guess the part where I kind of struggle with the meaning of the orange is that in the lighting design, and the lighting design is very cool too mm -hmm. in a lot of different ways, there was a very prominent orange light in specifically the scene where it's just Benny and George Mm -hmm. plotting violence against Erica. And I thought that was strange because it is religiously motivated violence, and yet we're getting this orange, 
you know, piercing the lighting of the scene. And I don't know, like it, it's to me that throws a wrench in my interpretation of orange equals secularism. And I'm okay with that. I like the tension and friction that this is all producing. But it kind of just makes me think that it's it's a look at me, look at me kind of choice more so than a this is what it means kind of choice. I think that there's value in that as, as far exactly. as the production and, choice goes. So yeah, the feeling of, of orange leaving us with ambiguity. So that exactly that. It's like we're just unpacking the fact that we were affected by this color, not like this color is means this and that is why this, right? Yeah, I agree. Like I'm looking over the kind of list of things we wanted to address. I feel like in our own roundabout way, we've kind of touched on all of them and I don't we know really did. we've been talking for. Maybe it's coming up on an hour or should we maybe do closing thoughts? I yeah. I do want to say out the gate, like I said, both not out the gate. We've been fully in the stadium. The gate has been closed. But case in point, what I'm about to say, both Brian and I have tried to articulate our thoughts. Again, we're coming right off of seeing opening night and we were very impacted and inspired. And this is definitely a piece where sitting with it, I know we'll probably have more articulate. I just feel like this conversation was a bit of like a stew of here's all the ingredients and I, so a, a bit chaotic in nature, but I think a, a positive way of swinging that and feeling that is, is that's okay. This is a weird episode for us. I think working through these, it is the kind of piece that forces you to think through it in this complicated way. And like, I, you know, I, I feel like I'm appreciating, like, I, I know I said I came out of it with a bit of like mixed feelings. Not sure how I feel. I think talking through it with you has made me appreciate a lot more. Like I didn't expect to go into this conversation calling it the anti-tartuffe and yet that's a yeah. discovery that came through talking through with you and you know I, that's part of the thing i love about this dialogue based criticism format that we do that it gives us the opportunities to take messy imperfect partial thoughts mm-hmm. and work them through with a trusted interlocutor so thank you jill for being that yes in this space. of course and i guess just like tipping my hat to rob kempson for creating a piece that very much case in point is a thought playground but I do feel like we could just keep trying to iron out all of the you know waves of thought we were hit with in this piece so uh, once again to arc for putting these themes and these thoughts on a stage and going all in and in a very visceral way it allows our brains to be spinning and yeah we appreciate appreciate it so much that's kind of my final remark, Ryan. Do you want, do you yeah, have any? I, I've said my piece. I think, yeah, this is, it, it's a very interesting piece. I encourage people to check it out for themselves if they've made it this far past the spoiler shield without <laughs> having seen it prior. And yeah, it's, to don't just see it and then be like, oh yeah, that's a thing I saw. Continue thinking about it. Talk about mm-hmm. it with a friend. Get in the comments. Tell us what you thought about it. Maybe we'll engage in further dialogue here. This is a piece that really does reward discourse and dialogue about it. And yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So again, this is Martyr happening at the Aki Studio Theater here in Toronto, put on by ARC. And it's happening from January 13th to January 29th. Get out, get your tickets and become invigorated and questioning and all those lovely things like Ryan and I were. So on the theme of orange, I'm going to say it is winter. It is January when we're recording this and probably still winter when this is coming out to your ears or eyes. Eat your oranges. Stay healthy, grab all that vitamin C, and we will see you on the next episode of The Cup. Cheers.